Welcome back to the Well Oiled Operations podcast. Today I am interviewing Courtney Vushnik. And here's what's really cool about Courtney she has built a business in a saturated market, has made it very, very unique where she has become, she has basically doesn't have competitors, which is what everybody listening should be thinking about, right? How do I create something so unique? that we don't have a competitor base, right? So Courtney is the founder of Lovo Chocolate. It is actually the first ever line of plant-based milk chocolate. Uh, My husband and I have both tried them and they are delicious. I am a big fan of dairy-free. He has to be dairy-free. And they graciously sent us some to try. And I was so excited to interview Courtney and go deep into her story of how did she create something so unique? What was that process like behind the scenes, right? Uh, what's, What's the strategy moving forward? How do you step into a market, like I said, that's super oversaturated and have success? So I think you're gonna love listening to Courtney's entrepreneurial journey and how she has made Lovo so successful. Enjoy. Hi, Courtney. Welcome to Well Oiled Operations. Thank you so much for having me. I am so excited to chat today. I love getting to learn from people that are not in my industry, doing something completely different, but I know there's so much we can grab from other businesses. And I love featuring and showcasing people like you on the podcast so that others can learn from your mistakes, your successes, you know, a little bit of everything. So welcome. I'm so happy to have you here. Thank you for that. And we're just always thrilled to talk about our journey and the ups and the downs. Yes. So let's start there. How did you actually start your company? Do you want to kind of give a background of like what your your journey looked like and then what it looks like today? Absolutely. So uh, 10 years ago, we launched Pasha Chocolate in the dark chocolate space. Okay. And Pasha is a, con- a collection of wonderful bars from 55 to 100% cacao and baking chips. But a dark chocolate uh, part of the chocolate industry represents about 20%. But we always were obsessed with the milk chocolate, which is sort of the holy grail within chocolate to chocolate people. And yeah. the that segment has largely been controlled by big brands, big players. And about Seven years ago, we started to think about how we could create a product for the milk chocolate category that was made from plant milks. And we didn't want to use just one plant milk. We wanted to use a collection of various plant milks. So we started by trying to make it taste like a dairy milk or a cow's milk product. And we were going down that road and making progress and, of course, going backwards, going forwards. Yeah. At the same time, in parallel, we were watching very closely the growth of the liquid plant milk category. Now, one in three Americans are drinking plant milk. It's gone from 35 billion to it's projected in 2030 to be $1.35 billion category. And I'm, I'm thinking of like what's to come because I grew up drinking cow's milk, but then now I don't drink it anymore. I drink plant based milk and I serve it to my children. So I can't imagine how many new generations are going to just start drinking that and continue and, and what how big it's going to get. Well, and that's a really important point because it over indexes with people who are 25 or younger. Those two generations largely are not going into cow's milk at the same rate. Yeah. You know, some are drinking cow's milk, but what we're seeing is that it's by use education. Okay. So you may put almond milk into your latte. You may put oat milk into your smoothie. You might put pistachio milk, you know, into your cereal. I think people misunderstood what would happen to the American refrigerator. You open a fridge now, in most households, there's two, if not three different plant-based milks and cow's milk in there. So we were watching that and it really helped us to understand that Americans were not rejecting the taste profile. They they liked the nut, how it tasted in their mouth. They liked the fact that it felt rich, but it was like a, it was fatty, but it was an all natural fat. The growth of it was so explosive that we then started to think about, we were making an error. We didn't have to try to make it taste like cow's milk or a dairy milk bar. We could actually just make it taste like the beautiful nut or oat that it could be. So we moved in that direction and we did a total pivot 
And of course, there's a big difference between a liquid product that you're using for in combination with something else and the mouthfeel and the temptation and the decadence that you expect from a chocolate. So we had made chocolate in different countries and we became certain we wanted to make our product, our Lovo product in Switzerland. Mm. Home of milk chocolate, 150 years, the creation, the technology, our ability to use all of that and become obsessed about how we're going to make it as creamy, as delicious. Um, so we went to Switzerland and we took the plant milk there and used all that beautiful history and techniques to create Lovo. Um, and then on top of that, it was always important to us, as it was with Pasha, that we wanted to be Rainforest Alliance certified, vegan, uh, dairy-free, obviously, only using non-GMO ingredients. Um, and Lovo is also certified with my climate. So we wanted to have the delicious taste, mm -hmm. the branding, and then all those attributes that are very important to us, very important to the business, very important to the consumer. Okay, so many things I want to dive into. So first, where did the dairy-free idea come from? Is this like something that you have an allergy with? Is this something you are just passionate about? I'm just curious. Or was it just trendy and you knew that was an area to head into? I grew up in a household where we were always eating in a very fringe way. And plant-based eating has always been a huge part of my life. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I myself don't have uh, dairy. I haven't had it since I was a child. That's really not the reason we did it. We really did it because we saw the opportunity. And also we just think that, you know, plant-based eating obviously is better for humans, but also it's better for the environment. Yeah. And I, I love hearing that because I think the why is important, right? When we're doing things, making big moves, it's good to know, like, where does it stem from? What is what is the why behind it? So, okay, love it. All the big players were going for one kind of plant milk, primarily oat or okay. rice. And we felt that that's not what the play was. There needed to be a line, the first and only line of milk chocolate across a variety of plant milks. I love that. And I think too, you said it, you're going up against a a lot of big players in this space. So how do you stand out? How do you be different, right? And a lot of the things that you're sharing is what's making you guys stand out specifically. So when you were looking at um, doing all those certifications, right? Getting it, like actually being able to show it on the brand that you are those specific things. I know that that costs a lot of money and that can be something that can be a lot of time consuming things as well. At what point, I mean, was it, was it ever a question of, should we do this and spend the money and spend the time? Is it, is it going to just be something we're going to have to do? Like, what were you thinking? What did that decision making look like? For non-GMO, it's something I would never not do. Mm. It's just who I am, what our values are. We had a history with it. We had obviously done it before. Um, we understood the process. Yes, it's they're very laborious processes, but they should be. And it's the right thing to do for our generation, the generations after us. Um, genetically modified food is not what I want to be in the business of selling. You know, And yeah. Rainforest Alliance as well, we want um, our cacao beans to make sure that A, we're leaving as much of the economic value in the region as we can, but also that they're teaching farmers how to farm going forward. It's yeah. not a blanket certification. It's a certification of turning those people into business people. It's a complex process. They all are. From a commercial point of view, it's becoming more and more important to the consumer. Yeah. And I'm so happy for that. But frankly, even if it wasn't, I would, I would do it. I love it. Yeah. And for I'm one of those people that are going to look at it, check and see, you know, if there's if there's milk, if there's dairy, things like that, but also where, what is it saying? What are those certifications? Do I see the non-GMO, all of that? So yeah, if your consumer is wanting it, needing it, then some of those things are going to be something you really want to take serious and do. So that makes a lot of sense. Um, what is something that, uh, like maybe a big lesson learned or a big mistake you will never forget that you will never make again after just, you know, the, the last few years in this journey? It's not so much in this business as it is just in general. And yeah. all the businesses I've been lucky to be involved with is you have to always be 150% objective. You have to take yourself out of your business and 
look at the product on the shelf as a consumer and not be fooled by all the time you put into something, all the thinking, all the research. If there is something wrong with it, if the if the brand isn't strong enough, if under the you know crazy bad lighting it looks terrible, you know the certifications no one can read them. Somebody else comes out with something else the week before. You've got to you've got to adjust. You have to pick yourself up, make those changes, get out of your head, and move forward. Yeah, so good. And I've heard you say um, how you obsessed over the product, right? And I think that's the same thing that you're bringing up is it's so many times it's easy to fall in love with your business, fall in love with this baby, right? But really, you have to make sure you have everything to back it as well. So if if people are listening and they're not obsessing over that product, their program or service, whatever they're selling, I really encourage you to slow down. And like you just said, Courtney, look at it objectively, right? Like pull yourself out and really judge it based off of what everything else is going on in the marketplace. And you're going to make an error. Every I've never, I mean, you go to Expo West every year, 100,000 companies, 100,000 people, like, you know, over 10,000 companies. I've never met an entrepreneur who said, we got it absolutely 100% right. We just nailed it. Immediately, after day two, we've learned something else and we're going to adjust. And I'm just saying, do it much of that adjustment upstream as you can. So how do you stand out in this marketplace? I, I know you've brought up like you've done certain cer- certain certifications and things like that. What else is part of your plan and strategy to stand out in such a saturated market? You have to be seen as an interrupter in the category. You have to go into the category. And yes, it's a big market. It's a, you know, it's an elephant and we're a fly right now. But the truth is, it's not a static market and no one's doing it exactly the way we're doing it. There's, we don't have a competitor right now. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think that we have to have a brand positioning that's unique. We have to have a modern aspect to ourselves. We have to be seen to um, primarily the female buyer as someone who is making her life slightly, I don't mean easier, but we're solving something she's looking for. And also that you know, life is complicated for people. There's so much information coming at women right now in a, you know, in terms of career and personal, et cetera. We want to be that moment of, you know, of lightness, of fun. You know, we want it, it to be delicious first, also interesting, the messaging to be dynamic. We want to continue to come out with new products all the time, new formats. We want to be seen as, you know, something that they want to be a disciple for. Well, and it's no coincidence that you don't have competitors. You are actively looking at the marketplace saying, what is it missing? What could we be doing? So you've been very intentional from the start, it seems like. I mean, I hope so. That was our aim. And that's what what we really were peering over the fence saying, wait a sec, there's something not being done here. I think that if you have a massive business, and this is a slice of the business, you know, your your perspective has to be slightly different. Well, we're, we are saying this is where we want to sit. This is what we want to grow. This is how we want to evolve. This is, you know, we, we don't, we want to create other um, products. We want to create other formats, as I said, but we also want to be able to move forward with the consumer as, as that consumer says, I have a repertoire of chocolate bars. I love all these chocolate bars. They have different roles in my life, but we just want to be one of those bars. Design plays a big part, right? So I would love to hear what you are doing. And I know you have a mantra about the shelf never lies. Can you kind of go into that a little bit and share what that means? I think that the packaging, um, particularly on a product like this, becomes paramount because, you know, we are communicating in a variety of ways, but we're obviously not spending $100 million in advertising. So the role of the pack becomes very important. I want to go to the shelves and I want people to feel the dynamicism coming off our package. I want them to look at that logo and say, wow, that's interesting. Why is it called this? Why is it called that? Um, I see that there's four different SKUs right now. You know, what makes them, you know, taste different from each other, which is my favorite nut, which is, you know, and that's going to be our challenge, like getting somebody to pick it up off the shelf and say, you know, I think it might be as delicious as my normal milk chocolate, or I'm going to give it a try. Um, But 
you know, as we as we said, I think it's also just whether you're talking about a bricks and mortar retailer or our business on Amazon, you know, which is, you know, it's going well already on Amazon. And, you know, the question is, how are we going to make sure that RA plus content continues to be as interesting as anyone else's or better? You know, how do we get somebody to go into the store and give us a shot? Because they're going to judge you based on the outside, right? They're going to look at it, quickly glance and decide yes or no. So good. Well, I would love to be, I would love to know, Courtney, where is your zone of genius in Lolo? Like, where are you putting most of your time and energy specifically? Uh, you know, I'm obsessed with what makes the consumer interested and motivated. Uh, I want to help that woman. I want to make her life a bit more fun and full of things that she enjoys and that she feels like she wants to talk to her community about. Uh, but I think in a small business, you really are doing all sorts of things. And I, I love that. I love the fact that every day is different. You're pushing yourself in a whole bunch of directions. You don't necessarily know where it's going to come from, um, where the challenges are. But, um, you know, work in the, working with the consumer, for sure, understanding the consumer, trying to communicate with the consumer, also working with the retailers, getting the product on the shelf, supporting the product. How are we going to get the, the velocity that we want to see? Yeah. Uh, product development, new products, what's next in the pipeline. Um, so both on the consumer side and on the trade side, for sure. And you've just listed like a million different things, but that is the life of a small business owner, right? We wear many, many hats, but it's just so important to understand like, what is our biggest priority? And and truthfully, what is your biggest and best use of your time? So I love that you were able to kind of dig in and, and share more of that as well. Um, what has it looked like for you to build your company, to build a team? Um, any struggles or anything you can share on growing the team outside of just you? We have a team that's divided between the market and the office, so to speak. Um, we try to be you know, we stay quite small initially. I'm a big believer in, I don't really want to give anything away until I've done it myself. Mm -hmm. There's so much available over that we've seen change over 10 years, um, where you can do things on the cloud that you couldn't have done 10 years ago. So before we have someone else do a function, whether internally or externally, I want to make sure that I've done it. I know how it's how it how it's being done. Um, we're figuring out if it's the best route or if we should be looking at four different platforms. You know, I think the entrepreneurial road is really scary for people and it's fundamentally uncomfortable and you have to be willing to find the comfort in the uncomfortable. And many people say that this is what they want. Um, and I think it's really different than what people think it's going to be. It's gritty. Yours. You have to be scrappy. You have to be changing things. You have to be doing things that people say are impossible every single day for less money. Um, and, you know, I think the people who I see who do well in an environment like this are people who actually really find that puzzle amazing and enjoyable and they want to be part of it. But it's not necessarily, you know, because it's not because of a unique set of skills. I think it's more because who they are wired as a human being. Mm -hmm. My husband just said to me, I feel like you're never happy. You, like you're you're grateful, but you always are looking for something new. I'm like, that is how I'm wired. That is never going to change. I'm always looking at the, the next thing that I want to build, create, do, right? That is just a lot of how a lot of us are wired. You want to learn those specific things before you start to delegate. And I'm a huge believer in that. A lot of times I think small business owners try to delegate too fast and yes. get things off their plate because they don't want to do it. But I think that some of the things you're talking about are essential. Those skill sets are so important for you as a CEO to know, to understand, to learn. Not that you have to keep it on your plate long term, but absolutely, I always say like know enough to be dangerous to have that conversation with the person you eventually, you know, give that that position away to. So really, really important for people to hear that you're saying I'm getting in there, I'm getting my hands dirty, I'm learning this, then I'm teaching and delegating as you as you set up the systems. Does that sound right? I'm not saying that we do, that I do it, all of it, but I'm trying to do as much of it. And I also think that it's also sometimes you will think you've made a decision, you get 80% of the road down there, down the road, and then you look at it and you don't want retrospectively to think, I should have looked at that other platform or I should have spoken to that other company. Um, you really want to, I think, be opinionated on 
everything that just impacts the consumer experience. Mm. And that's on our website. That's, you know, in a retail environment, that's at a, you know, that's at a consumer show. But all of those pieces come together within the underbelly of how the business is built mm. and where people see our priorities, where people see, you know, what we are putting our time against. And we've been, always been very careful about the consumer you know, communication and we've always over communicated with our customers and people really appreciate it. And that's important too. So you can't do everything and you can't do it at the speed that others can do it. If you're doing it to your, to what meets with your standards and your brand sometimes. So did you uh, fund, like, did you get funding for Lovo or did you bootstrap it? I'd love to hear that story. We've totally bootstrapped. Was that an intentional thing? Were you going out saying we're going to bootstrap? Did I would love to hear that journey. So it, it's just the way we want our journey to be. We want to do it the speed we wanted to do it, the products, the quality, um, the the building of the of the products in the organization. Um, we feel that it's possible to do it that way. Um, and there obviously there are some businesses that it is not a possibility especially when it's a manufacturing product, right? Which is what yeah. we're doing. Of course. Um, but I wouldn't do it the other way, at least initially, because I don't want to spend my time externally communicating our goals. I want to work in the business. Yeah. I want to be in the dirt of the business. And I also think that um, a lot of women's businesses don't get funded, mm-hmm. right? And that's, yeah. that's one thing. So you can go that direction or you can just say, we're just going to figure out how to do it for less initially. And certainly it is absolutely possible because of what we said, there's so much available and, um, but you have to be prepared that it's going to go up. It's going to go down. You're going to have, you know, things that'll work well, things that'll fail. You may have to go a bit slower, but it would, that's the choice I would always make. Did you have to, or I should ask maybe like, what was your strategy in knowing you are the person funding this? Like when you would make these mistakes or make big mistakes, especially with you know, maybe there was a mistake where it was like the physical chocolate was messed up and that batch was bad or just anything like that I would be curious about. Um, well, that those things are gutting. It's absolutely terrible. Um, you know, and that's... How do, you, how do you get through it when it happens and it's just, it feels like the worst thing ever right this second? It means you have to do a trade-off. You may, you may be planning something else that you're going to do that's consumer facing and you may have to pull it. And then you have to go back and, um, or there was a packaging problem that said there was an error on it or something like that. Um, like through 10 years, we've had most things happen to us. So therefore you just have to say, okay, well, it means we're going to do it a year from now, or we're not going to do this promotion or this, this event. Um, and to say it in the way I'm saying it makes it sound very matter of fact at the time, it's not, it's terrible and so disappointing and everyone's upset. But, you know, we just, I just have to keep, you know, eyes forward and say, you know what, we don't have a choice. This is about the quality of the product or this is about something happening um, while the product's being imported and there's, you know, there's an extra tax or something. Um, But those things have never been you know, so soul destroying that it, 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 we couldn't go ahead. Well, and and here's the thing. If you are not expecting, right, these fails, these mistakes, these mess ups, it, you really need to expect the unexpected in business, right? It's it's never going to go the way you want it to 100% of the time, whether it's something with your product, it's the economy, the market, like whatever's happening. So I agree. I mean, you're going to feel it. It's going to it's going to be dramatic in the moment. But how do you just continue to keep your eye on the prize and to keep moving forward? I think it's also related to what your husband said. Like, you know, if you have this innate sense of being, you know, uncomfortable, it's actually a bit of what you expect. Yeah. You know, I'm not saying I expect, I have a very positive outlook, but I don't expect it to be, you know, a well manicured path set out in front of me. I know, you know, it's going to be, you know, thorny at points. So those things are going to happen. But I think when somebody has a different experience, or it's like you asked about hiring people, many people have said to me, this person might have the greatest experience, but they, they haven't existed in the environment. And you don't appreciate sometimes how hard it is every day because you've done it for so long. Mm. Like I've always been interested in business ever since I was very young. I had my first business when I was 10. You know, this is a part of my psyche. Mm. So, you know, I think that those things are more in tune to someone like you or like I. That's all. Yeah, absolutely. 
Well, Courtney, thank you so much for being here. I would love to have you share where can people find your chocolates? I can actually vouch for them. You had set, Your team had sent me some. So my husband has to be dairy-free. He's lactose intolerant. I prefer dairy-free. So we both actually really enjoyed them. So I appreciate you sending those over. But where can people find them or even just like learn more about you? Well, thank you for trying them, first of all. Yes. Oh, my God. Well, I was excited because, like I said, I... Um, I'm like 95% dairy free. I, I eat it once in a while. I can eat it. I don't, I prefer not to. He has to be. So we always have, like you said, nut milks and things like that in the house. So I was like, oh, this is perfect. Well, we're, it's available on our website at lovochocolate.com, also on Amazon. Um, also, we're in Sprouts and in um, Albertsons as well. Um, and if you go to our website, there's a store locator with lots of independents near everybody as well. So, you know, little by little. Yeah. More, more locations. Um, congrats on your success. What is next for Lobo? We're looking at other formats, um, possibly other nuts, um, and just making more treats available for other for people as you know. Yeah. To, so we can go to where they are, um, whether it's you know a Sunday night when they're having with their family or in their car when they're going you know to pick up or somebody who's having it you know in their desk at the office so we just want to be on that daily journey well congratulations on your success and thank you so much for being here and sharing the ups and downs of entrepreneurship with us 